Hi, this is Sally Varaka. I am joined here today by Yael Kainer about how anxiety has affected her life as part of my project to take that shame and taboo lid off of anxiety. Hi, Yael. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Yael Kainer, of course, and um, I live in Malay Adjumim now. Um, I have seven children yeah. and 26 grandchildren um spread all across the world almost wow <laughs> um yeah, yeah. Come on, yeah. <laughs> so so very um and uh i've been a coach for about almost two years yeah. i think um dealing in the area of resilience and building personal resilience mm. and um through my journey that's how i got there so um my journey started in New England in America in 1959, yeah. <laughs> last century. Um, and I grew up in a family that uh, my father was a serial entrepreneur. And so there was a lot of instability with that. Um, some of his businesses were successful and some were not. So um, there was a lot of um, financial stress uh, mm. Not that they included us children in it, but of course, behind closed doors, we could hear it. You feel it. Yes. Definitely. Children really pick up on it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So uh, um, my father had a growth mindset. My mother has a scare, still has a scarcity mindset. So I, you know, I was influenced by those two things. My parents worked really hard. And um, that's how I thought that you have to work. You have to work really hard if you're going to get anywhere, which is. Um, yeah. Stressful because um, we were working in the family business from the time I was a very small child. From the time that I could drag a garbage can, I was working in my father's cleaning business and working in his store. And basically, I was existing on Maalox. Um, do you know what Maalox is? Maalox is like an antacid. Uh, my stomach, oh my goodness, I had anxiety from the time I was like. So this is what I wanted to yeah, ask yeah. you. What is your earliest memory of anxiety? Um, I think the financial, just knowing that there wasn't enough or, or that we were going to be short or that we had a payroll to meet and these kinds of things. Um, couple that with, I was doing my regular life as an eight or nine year old going to school. Yeah. Um, and when we, when I was 12, my parents moved us away from a Jewish area into uh, the border of Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts where it all comes together. There are no Jews up there. Uh, there weren't then. Chabad there now, but yeah. <laughs> there weren't then. And so going to school, I had major school anxiety. I had undiagnosed ADHD, which um, <laughs> lay yeah. Di yeah. Yes. Did you know that you had anxiety? Did you know that what you were experiencing was called anxiety? Not then, not until I started to study psychology as probably a 12 year old. That's when I oh, first wow. came across. Yeah, uh, yeah. I used to sleep under a, a poster of Sigmund Freud, <laughs> and I had, I had yeah, a <laughs> yeah. I do things that you know, like to the max. But um... <laughs> but we were twelve. We were into like boy bands and like. <laughs> no, I was working and going to school and dreaming of getting out of a town of four thousand people. But we had yeah. more animals than people in my town. So I was living in one of these rural, like little hamlets, and it's the best place in the world to grow up unless you're Jewish. <laughs> if you're Jewish, it was a nightmare because there was a lot of ignorance and you know a lot yeah. of um, a, an undercurrent of anti-Semitism. Although I'm happy to report that now that my classmates are now 63, some of yeah. them actually support Israel. Some of them oh, uh, wow. teach in a one teaches in a Jewish school. These are my tormentors, you know. <laughs> so. So they made life very hard because, you know, children can be very cruel. And um, I knew in my head that I was smart, but it wasn't showing up in the tests because I had test anxiety. I would just be a, a total wreck. So I made up And you also mind. mentioned you had ADHD undiagnosed. ADHD big time, which only got diagnosed when I went to coaching school. When Dr. Leia said to me, have you thought about this? <laughs> that was and only I'm like, saying, how long oh, ago? Like two years ago. Two years ago two years ago and I, I, I try not to see the life through the prism of oh what could have been but you lived just 61 years with undiagnosed <laughs> ADHD 
Yes, I had no memory really. Like, like once I walk out of a situation, it's over for me and yeah. no organizational skills. So I knew I was bright, but I didn't know how to organize myself. But mm. I knew enough that I needed to get out of that town. So I looked at my parents and I said, I love you very much. Kissed them both goodbye. And I left for the next big city, which is Wait, Worcester. Not how, old big city. <laughs> Wait, how old are you? How old are you? I was 16 and I, I went to the university without a, a diploma. And I said to them, if I do well here, can I stay? And they're like, give us your tuition, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I handed in my tuition and um, I did. My first um, semester, I was, you know, already in the 376 range. For, One second, you, you went know, to university at 16? I did. I did. What did you yeah. do? Yeah. What did you study? I, I'll tell you what I did. My, my strategy was to cherry pick my classes so that I only took classes that I knew I was going to be really good in. So yeah. I, I went in for psychology, but then I quickly realized that I'd have to take statistics. I was like, uh, uh recalculate because <laughs> math is not my friend. So yeah. um, what happened is I ended up making um, an independent study major of Jewish history my first week on campus. Chabad approached me and yeah. invited me and I never left. <laughs> and, you know, while I was in university, I became from and, and that also caused, you know, family drama and anxiety. And I didn't go home for about a year. And my parents- When you were 16, this all happened when, when you were- was... yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and I, that was the first time that I outwardly defied my parents because I knew I had a, a bigger authority, a higher authority that I had to answer to. Um, yeah. And so they weren't happy. My father once drove me to a Kentucky Fried Chicken. He said, you will eat. I said, I won't eat. <laughs> we had a Mexican stand up. I won. <laughs> so, um, it's only later yeah. <laughs> that my mother looked at my son and said, thank you for having all these, you know, great grandchildren. Because <laughs> he has, oh. my son has five now. So my mother at the time did not appreciate what I was going for. Um, but but she was also, you know, on the other hand, she's the one who made me so Jewish. So what did they expect was going to happen? Um, so I actually cherry picked all my classes, graduated at 20, got into Yeshiva University um, Graduate School for social work. Yeah. First day there. First day I meet a handsome Sephardic young rabbi. <laughs> Sephardi. Who takes, yeah. Who takes me to this Portuguese synagogue. I lose my breath on both accounts. And before you know it, I was married to him. Um, yeah. <laughs> I left graduate school thinking, oh, I'll go back later. You know, he needed a Rebbitzin. I, you know, uh, was how, uh, it was how old were you at this stage? I was about 21 by then, 2021, 20, somewhere in there. Um, and I got how was your, and how yeah. was your anxiety at that stage? Um, it was pretty, uh, from living in New York, going from a small hamlet to New York, it was awful. Because okay. and I was on a train that was held up in Spanish Harlem. I was carrying two kosher chickens in my backpack. I left the chickens on the train and made for the exit when the doors opened. And I thought if they shoot me, at least they'll shoot me in my back. And then um, I had a number of traumatic things happen to me when I was in New York. Um, I watched a Holocaust survivor um, jump out the window telling her no, 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 and boom. Yeah. So by the time, by the time it came time to go out and become a Rebbitz and take over a congregation. Um, we headed to San Francisco. Well, I didn't know I was terrified of earthquakes. <laughs> it was really scary and we kept having them, you know? And so like the first one, okay. And then, you know, by the time I got to the 6.1, which is the big Loma Linda one, it yeah. was, it didn't affect San Francisco as much, but my confidence was completely shaken. Um, we, <laughs> when I moved to San Francisco, here I was this young bride, um, and I was so anxious. We're at the Fairmont Hotel, which is this fancy, fancy um, Wait, yeah, hotel. Wait, can I ask you, did you know, because you said from the age of 12, you labeled it anxiety. So did you know at 21 that this is anxiety? I knew it was anxiety, but I didn't know what agoraphobia was. And I was uh, well on my way to developing agoraphobia. So okay. um, every time I had to get in the car, I would like cry. If we went up someplace high, I would cry. Um, and my new husband was looking at me like, what did I marry? Like, what is this? <laughs> he didn't know yeah. what to do with me. And it, it was hard for him. Oh, it was really yeah. hard. And, you know, he's starting out and doing a congregation and, and I was trying to be as helpful as possible, but I was just a basket case. Then when the big Loma Linda 
which it didn't affect San Francisco, but it was pretty scary, you know, like yeah. um, the telephone poles were moving and everything. I'm standing between two cribs with two newborns, you know, like a year and a half apart, more or less. Mm. And I'm trying to decide which one I'm supposed to pick up, <laughs> you know, it was very scary. Anxiety, and, yeah. But right. I walked every, I walked everywhere. I, you know, I didn't drive when I lived in San Francisco. Um, and I definitely had agoraphobia. I was terrified. So I started looking and researching. You didn't have an internet back then, but um, yeah. I was able to come up with the name of a doctor named Dr. Robert DuPont. And he was a very big deal in desensitization. He had therapy groups. He had a newsletter. I carried that newsletter like next to my heart for like years. So I was in San Francisco for five and a half years. I was a complete basket case. Um, I find out that Dr. DuPont is in Rockville, Maryland. Yeah, I get a phone call from Rockville, Maryland, saying they're looking for a young, so not young, but they're looking for a Sephardic rabbi to a newly formed congregation. It, it had always been, you know, kind of random, and now they were. Gosh, I took you there. So I said to him, "I said, well, do you have pizza?" And he's like, "Yeah." I said, "Do you have a mikvah?" He says, "Yeah." I said, um, "Do you have a rabbi?" <laughs> and I proceeded to basically push him into moving to Rockville. Well. For me, Rockville is great. I loved Rockville. I yeah. learned to drive. I went to Dr. DuPont's um, groups, and that was so helpful. I mean, meeting state troopers who couldn't cross bridges. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm in the right company. Can you tell us how did that help you? Um, validating that I wasn't crazy and that yeah. um, working through the steps of, of breaking down the desensitization, learning how to um, work with the anxiety. Um, I I started to take college classes. I started to, you know, even though I'd finished college, but I, I always am in a learning process. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm always in some class. Um, so I learned how sure, to drive. Sure, you are actually. That's really funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it it's will be that true. way. <laughs> yes. So yeah. I go to, to Rockville and we start having these tremendous opportunities and um, that come with being the only Sephardic, you know, shul for between Philadelphia and I don't even know where, um, Charleston maybe. Um, I don't okay, even know where so anyway, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know, but hopefully people are watching right now. So, yeah. so if you don't know America, I was on, um, we got opportunities. So I got to be on television with Joan Nathan, the cookbook author. Um, yeah. I got to, to speak and give a class on Sephardic cooking on the National Mall in front of the the Capitol in Washington for the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival. We had so much fun, so many opportunities to do things. I got to meet Sharon Stone's first husband. Hmm. <laughs> you know, like weird, random stuff. Wow. <laughs> and as well as like rabbis passing through town and amazing, yeah. amazing people and congressmen and senators, because we were right in the heart of where everybody lives you may work in dc but you live in rockville or bethesda or Chattanooga, you know these, yeah. these posh areas so that's where our show was um wait and how old were you at this stage um this was i was probably 20 30 just turned 30 okay. and okay I, i'd had two kids i arrived in rockville pregnant so <laughs> Yeah. and then yeah. the president of the congregation's wife comes to the door and she's like so elegant she looks like one of the she could be a, a Zsa Zsa Gabor's you know twin sister and she comes in and she goes is it always like this oh my gosh <laughs> Sadly, no yeah. this is the better days usually it's worse <laughs> I could never do anything right. The most embarrassing thing is I went, <laughs> I couldn't do anything right with this lady. Um, I went right. to the, the um, Kennedy Center to go see Jackie yeah. Mason. I went, my dress was inside out. I was in such a, you know, <laughs> trying to get out of the house. It's such a typical funny. mom story. Oi. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I just went in the bathroom and changed it and rolled with it. What am I gonna do? Yeah, but sometimes you just need to laugh. Yeah, I remember once, honestly, I, I just want to say, I remember once my my youngest was a few months old and I went to like one of these like gun parties for one of my other kids. And I only noticed once I got there, I was wearing boots, but like two different boots. They weren't matching boots. They weren't the same boots. <laughs> that is a mom story. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I'm being a Rebbiton. I'm working yeah. for the bar and... I'm raising three kids and um, one of the children that I was raising is um, my middle boy. 
biological boy. Um, he was bipolar. He was gay. He was so anxious. I spent a lot of time just trying to teach him self-soothing soothing techniques, you know, like just, it was so hard, so, so hard. And in and out of institutions and just like really hard. So, um, so that went on for, for a bit. And then when we, when the boys were 12, 14 and 16, it became apparent that we weren't going to stay a couple because it, it was yeah. just not good for either of us. So we moved, well, <laughs> with unknowingly, we sold our house and we moved to New York and we got a bigger congregation and it was fabulous. And, I, and once again, I loved it <laughs> and not so much. Wow. And how so, old were you um, at this stage? When was this? I what? was in my late thirties. Uh, yeah. Late 30, no, 40, 40 ish. Okay. <laughs> Um, can, you, can you just actually, um, I just want to take you back, okay, you said about your son feeling anxious, did you realize that like, what he had was anxiety? That was one component of it, but the bipolar really overrode everything. It just was was so chaotic to live with him. I mean, his fingers were always bitten down to the, the nubs, and he was just a nervous wreck, and he would like talk a lot, but that was also part of bipolar. So, yeah. um, and how old was he? He was 14 when we moved to New York. We yeah. moved to Great Neck, which is one of the bigger Sephardic communities. It's like, you know, 4,000 people come to shul on a weekend. And how, like, how did it affect your um, the anxiety inside of you? I was actually so happy at that time because I had enrolled myself in CW Post University. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was curious about library science, so I, I you know, did that. Yeah. yeah. And that's how I sort of kept myself, you know, together. And then um, at a certain point, I came back to D.C. and I brought the kids with me. The oldest one was already in Israel. So um, basically, I had the younger two boys with yeah. me. But living with a bipolar child was a, an exercise in daily anxiety. Um, I had to call the police to take away a knife. I can't even show you like how big this knife was. It, yeah, it was like a hunting knife. It was really scary in the... Um, you know, he would sit on me. I'm not a small woman, you know, I mean, I'm short, but I'm not small. And yeah. he would sit on me and he would just like lose it. And he just was running the show. Unbeknownst to me um, at the time, he had a keystroke program on my computer, which means that he could read my passwords. He went into my bank account and took out $250,000, which was the sum total of everything I had in this world up until that point. Um, and he spent it on the Forex, which is, um, you know, the foreign exchange uh, trading market. Within yeah. a week, I went from having enough and working and trying to make a new life for myself to being, you know, every. Wait, you split from your husband at this point, right? Yes. Yes, you yes. split from your husband. Okay. Like the working. And eventually he moved back to the Maryland area. Um, so the boys, you know, were going back and forth between him and myself. Right. We were in the next building, you know, we were yeah. like where are we going to go <laughs> okay and how old was your son um he was 14 at the time no i mean how old was he when he took the 200,000 he was 14 14 smart kid Oof. oh scary smart scare <laughs> really scary yeah. smart. He, he was he was like a chess game and he was like 10 steps ahead of me always you know i i mean i'm yeah. not stupid but i'm not i was not like that so um, that was very scary. And, you know, at one point I opened a gift basket business. He stole my car the night of the gift basket business opening. He took my um, uh, Toyota 4Runner and took it for a joyride. While I'm in the opening, hundreds of people, you know, well, maybe not hundreds. Okay, maybe a hundred wow. people were uh, at this opening. I mean, every step that I took, he was there. And it's Five like, steps ahead. Know, yeah. Hello, financial ruin. Hello at my new old friend, anxiety. So yeah. I was very, you know, it was like scary, really scary to realize that, that you don't have anything, no resources. You know, I don't have parents with money. I don't have any, you know, I, I wasn't getting alimony um, or any of those things. He had given me my cash out and that was it. Um, what were you doing so to help yourself during that time? Like to help the anxiety? What were you doing to help yourself? Uh, probably not constructive things because I probably was not eating as well as I should have I was working too much um 
And just, you know, I had um, fallen in with somebody who was very charismatic. Talk about, you know, toxic friends. <laughs> yeah, I had somebody who actually, I went to her house for Shabbos and she stole a check from the back of my checkbook. So I didn't <laughs> notice it. Wrote herself a check for $5,000 in her handwriting <laughs> of whatever I had left, you know, like it was the saddest thing. So, so yeah, I was happy to get How did you pack. pick up on that? Um, I think, I don't know. So I don't know how I knew, but yeah, but we figured it out. I took a look at the handwriting and I'm like, oh, I know that handwriting. So yeah, that was, that was very upsetting, but eventually she, she gave the money back, but it was just so, <laughs> such a horrible dark chapter. <laughs> yeah. It, you're very vulnerable when you're by yourself, you know, yeah. not the rebel anymore. You know, I'm got you three young really kids. Know. You're young. Yeah. And a sick child, a really sick yeah. child. I couldn't leave him very much. And when I did, it was a disaster. He would like find ways to, to you know, punish me for getting out. So that was bad. Um, and I was kind of in this whole state for like two years. Um, and why is that? Because I was in Aguna. He, uh, my ex, didn't agree to give the get yet. Um, eventually he did. You know, he yeah. called me up and said, six o'clock, park heights. Want to go for dinner after? I said, yes, yes, no. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but the irony is he married somebody that I totally love. I know. My and her name is also, it's, it's, what's her name? Yeah. Yael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's a wonderful human being. And, and I believe me, I, I bless him every day because, you know, yeah. he, gave, he gave me many gifts and, um, and my freedom. So, yeah. um, so I got the get in, uh, about 2004 and in 2004, I met this man um, a fellow Rebbitson who had only met me once or twice called me up and said, I have a man for you. And I said, oh, sure you do. <laughs> Cause I had been out with nine frogs, each one, one released from prison practically, you know, like don't ask. Wait, what, can I just what, ask you, Al, how was the anxiety now? The anxiety in your life? How was it at this stage of your life? You've got your, you've pretty, got your get Pretty high, pretty, pretty high. high. It, I'm in debt. Mr. Kaner, we'll call him Yosef. Okay. I call him Mr. Kaner because my grandmother always called my grandfather Mr. Wallach. So I call him Mr. Kaner. So, so Mr. Kaner took my whole batch, my whole peckle off, my whole, all my problems, and he sorted them out in a very non emotional way. And he helped me figure out that I was hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt because he also opened up, Kaylee, opened up credit cards in my name without me knowing it. And bought god knows what <laughs> literally when did you find exactly. out that he had something on your computer whatever that word is that he was taking your password it's a keystroke program my husband figured it out my current husband wow. <laughs> figured it out yeah it was it was very very bad and the police kept saying to me well there's nothing we can do to get you off the hook you know we know you didn't do it however um what however we want you to um, to arrest him. And I said, I can't do that. Cause I said, a Jewish mother doesn't do that. Second of all, you don't criminalize mental illness. Yeah. I wouldn't allow it. And so I suffered through everything. I had lousy credit for going on a decade. I couldn't, I couldn't buy a candy bar, you know, like, and I've had to watch everything and I've had to reestablish myself and, and I'm not even there yet, <laughs> but we'll get there. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. I'm Lubavitcher yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for sure. So, yeah. so I was an Aguna, then I wasn't an Aguna, and then I married Mr. Kaner, and we moved to Baltimore, or I moved to Baltimore with him. He was already there. So yeah. we went through all of this, and my- And your two older kids family, came with you? Your two younger kids, they came with you? Uh, no. Actually, they went, um, they went back to their father. Yeah. Um, one of them moved to Atlanta, um, and that, you know, that had, this is the sick one. So he got a taste of what I've been living with for- upwards of four years so it was really hard and then eventually he went in because I didn't arrest him he went into the army American army started yeah. in the navy didn't like it went into the army he got himself into law school he didn't like it then he got himself into nursing school didn't like it you, you know you're seeing a pattern here <laughs> so um, yeah. yeah so that was that was rough but um with Mr. Kaner it's like I came home uh, my anxiety level suddenly up but the interesting thing about him and he doesn't mind me talking about it. Wait, is that how long ago was this? How long ago was this? Just in 2004. Time for... Fine. Okay. 2004. So yeah. the, the 
girl who read the shit up, who said to me, I have a guy for you. She says, he's got agoraphobia. I said, don't worry. I know what to do about that. <laughs> you know, having passed through it. So I was yeah. so super confident, you know. Um, it turns out he's been looking in, on his own journey for many, many years. Um, some things have improved, some things I was able to do. Like when I had a car, I was able to get him out and, and do stuff and, you know, use some of those mindfulness kinds of techniques to really calm him down. But we're really each other's best balance. We have a- Oh, you know what, yeah, I'll, I just realized what? something. Sorry, without interrupting what? you. Do you want to just define what, what agor agoraphobia is for oh, people that don't know? Sure. Some agoraphobia is fear big dog. of the outside. Yeah fear yeah. of the outside. He yeah. is terrified of going beyond his boundaries. And yeah. so my job or the therapist's job is to push him past those boundaries. So I yeah. was able to do that. But then when I came to Israel, I didn't have a car anymore. So he just started being home. So, um, you know, the joke is I always know where he is. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember you used to joke about that with me. Yeah. You used to joke that with me. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah, really be about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. he's super reliable, and he, not only that, he helped me fulfill my dreams. I got four more kids to love in the bargain because I had always wanted a big family, and and uh, yeah. that wasn't going to happen. So now we're up to seven kids. Um, unfortunately, in two thousand and two, the same week that COVID came to Israel, Ailey chose to commit suicide, leaving this was us this, all. This is their second son. By, by who was bipolar? bipolar. Yeah. Yeah. He had a heartbreak. He couldn't sustain it. Um, he had broken up with his partner of 14 years. And um, Pete Buttigieg, he was working on a, on a, what do they call it, on a political campaign and that, you know, petered out. And so all that manic energy just had nowhere to go in this little body. Um, so I lost him in 2002 and I took a long time. I did what I call my swinging 2002 meditation. 2002 is two, 2020. No, not 2000, 2000, 2020. 2020. Yeah, 2020. 2020. Thank you. <laughs> Just yeah. before Corona, so, it was. What was it? February time? March? I lost him in March. March. That was the first week that. Oh, Corona it was just really before came. Purim. It was just before Purim. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right before his 34th birthday. So around so, now. I, yeah, that's how I know it, that I haven't seen you in in a year in person. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so basically I sat and I did swinging meditation and I just really tried to just connect with everything that he was and try to sort out all of the, the feelings. Cause I always have those feelings like, Oh, Ailey, I'm going to be working until I take my last breath. But then I have to like say, no, I'm not going to do it that way. Um, so I basically ha run a soup gamach to keep his memory alive. And because he was yes. a very giving person, even though he'd be giving some of my things, um, <laughs> Okay. Um, but I'm still his mother and I still, uh, yeah. you know, a dear friend of mine passed away and I said, go check on Sylvia, <laughs> you know, go, go up there, you know, wherever you are up there, just find her. Um, and that's comfort to me is, is, uh, is to keep that connection. So I also know with my anxiety that right before, maybe the month before, this is two years it's happened. Right before the yard site, I start getting more emotional. I start listening to Joan Baez singing, you know, Forever Young. Um, yeah. And, wow. and I start getting really like tender hearted and, and more tearful. But what I do now, I learned, is to give myself compassion, say, this is just how it is. And it might be like this, you know, till I take my last breath. Um, in the time after that, that's when I became a coach. Wait, yeah, can I just ask you, how do you give yourself compassion? In what ways? I tell, I Maybe tell there's somebody myself. here listening that needs to give themselves compassion. Well, I have some wonderful um, resources that I've been using, and um, there's self care for grief. Whoops, where is it? Self care for grief. And Who's I it by? Who's it by? Um, oh golly, I don't know the. Um, oh, it's a journal, um, or is it a book? Yeah, it's it's a journal. It's a journal. Fine. I got it on Zulily, and oftentimes on Zulily.com. Yeah. Um, they, they have that. So, you know, and I've learned, you know, 21 days of resilience. Um, I've tried to do all of these things, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk more about that later, but, um, okay. Yeah. Just, just to make myself feel better. And, and also I'm in a group with other, um, mothers of lost children. So that's been very, um, validating and it's, there's always somebody there, you know, like when I'm having a really hard day or even when I'm having a good day, you know? Um, there's always a mom that's 
you know, in the same situation. What, what's this group called? Course, um, it's, uh, what do they call it? It's through Tapestry. Anybody who, who wants to get in touch with me, I can put you in touch Fine. with the leaders. That's okay. No problem. Yeah. So that's good. So um, after this all happened and Corona happened, the opportunity to become a coach came up. And so I went to the Jerusalem um, Coaching Institute. And Yay! that was, Leah. yes, <laughs> that, that's where I met a pool full of people who are givers, doers, mm -hmm. you know, yes. uh, serving humanity. And that's where I wanted to be. That's where I found my tribe. So, Bar Hashem. So, okay, so that, that takes us to now. Um, so, okay, tell so me. okay, so um, now that we're at today, okay, um, what do you do for yourself to help yourself today? I know well, that you, first you I mentioned that you've got something that you wanted to well, share with I'm us. Gonna, I'm gonna tell you and I'll, I'll tell okay. you briefly, okay? Um, the current things that are going on with me right now is because yes. I am 62, that's menopause. So along with menopause comes anxiety, hello wow. friend, yeah. and sleeplessness. So- okay. um, which is not good for anxiety, go on. Not yeah. at all. A couple of resources, one of them is the, I started the group and then I handed it off um, yeah. because it was apparent that other people had bigger passions for that than me. I just had inspiration, but they have passion. So Tamar Schreiger and Jacqueline Rose are two of the most amazing women and they're running a group called um, the Menopause Cafe Israel. It's on a Facebook group. Facebook. It's a good group. On Facebook. Yes. Yeah. And so these women are experts. If they don't know something, they'll find it out. And so they're bringing in all kinds of other experts. And you want going through menopause? I actually recommend that group. I'm not going through menopause. I'm only 40. But I recommend that group. I know. I've like seen stuff that they've been posting on it. Yes. They're, they're doing amazing things. And I just stand back like this really proud mama. <laughs> so really happy. Um, the second thing is the anxiety is coming from the fact that I am 62 and that I feel like in my head, there's a ticking clock that will I be able to rebuild my finances before I need them? Um, yeah. you know, I, I always say I'm okay today unless I have to buy something. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's one of those, it's caught between Amuna and Hishtadlut. Yeah. <laughs> so Amuna is, I have everything I need now. now. I'm okay. Now. And Hishtablut is, I better like hop on it <laughs> and get, get going and save so, everything. So what are you doing to help yourself right now? Um, well, I'm working and I'm in service and that, that's a main thing. I'm working yeah. for um, one of the elderly agencies. I'm taking care of a very interesting 92 year old who's got all her marbles, just no body um, to speak of, you know, like on yeah. her arms and legs. And yeah. it's teaching me a lot. It's teaching me a okay. lot. And it's also made me want to do more. So this is a phase that I'm in now, but I also recognize that if I make a commitment that I want to live to like 103, that's like not unreasonable. My great grandfather wants whatever, 106. So why not? Okay. Why not try for it? Why not? <laughs> okay. It's true. So it's what does true. that entail? That entails yeah. taking care of yourself and eating right and getting enough yes. exercise. And I committed to all those things right now. Mm -hmm. So I actually have compassion. A you said compassion. <laughs> being compassionate to yourself. Absolutely. And I just want to add that this is something that really helps with anxiety as well. Taking care of your basic needs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, I actually am worried about running out of time to do all the things I want to do, which is I want to have my podcast and I want to have a coaching practice and I want to, you know, I want to, um, you will have, to you Please will, God, I, I have, <laughs> affirmations <laughs> yeah yes, yes yes i have i am i yes um so there's that and then um the last thing is uh not last thing but i mean what i've learned is that i can look at family drama now i have an aging mother and, and there's a lot that goes on with taking care of her and i'm not there for that and there's reasons why i'm not there because she's in florida and oh, i'm in okay. Israel. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah yeah and also she's very um She's very sure that I should be vaxxed. And I'm very like, I'm taking my time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I have to say to myself, and I learned this from my neighbor, not my circus, not my monkeys, except not my some monkey. of them are my monkeys. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, now, the last thing that I wanted to share with you um, is another piece. Okay. Uh the number one focus in my life, and it sounds odd, 
is sleep hygiene. I am so committed to going to sleep and because that improves your focus, improves your diet and improves your energy, improves, everything. improves your mood. It's good yes. for everything perfectly. So what I started out doing, and I never done this before because I, I was so afraid kind of of yoga because I didn't quite understand like the root of it and like I didn't yeah. know and being, being Lubavitch, they say don't connect with things. But at any rate, I found um, an app online, the Daily Yoga. And every yeah. day they do something. And sometimes I'm, I'm like doing downward dog and going, are you kidding me? <laughs> but I, <laughs> but I, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, you're doing, doing it. it. So you're helping yourself. And is, is, is <laughs> yes. the yoga helping your anxiety? It is. It is. Because okay. it sets me up by stretching and being you know, focusing and, and dialing down. Because when you're a high energy, I'm basically the energizer bunny on crack yeah um, is yes yes <laughs> whoever's listening to this it's so true yeah has so i hope you know what yeah i hope when i'm when i grow up i want to be have the energy just like you okay you will you will you start now you're all right um okay yeah. so the second thing that i do is when i sleep i do um blue sky hypnosis it's a guy named peter mclaughlin he is um a coach and yeah. he does like past life regression, I leave all that stuff out, but he has very good subliminal and audio, um, sub audible and subliminal kinds of um, tapes. So some nights I'm manifesting well, and some nights I'm uh, there. He's got an anxiety series. That's amazing. Oh, um, you can so. listen to it while you're sleeping and all you hear is either waves or rain, but if the messages are going into your brain, because you really shouldn't go to bed without a request to your subconscious for something that you want in this world. I can't imagine wasting eight hours sleeping and not trying to, to better myself while I'm doing it. So blue sky. What hypnosis, kind of messages? Um, okay. For example, when he's talking about anxiety, I am calm. I am okay. I am, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I can manage myself. I can, you know, whatever, all this kind of stuff. I love to listen to the one for weight loss. Cause he's like, I'm safe to lose weight. I'm okay. I have enough of everything that I need. Blah, 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 blah. He's fantastic. Um, also, I don't have any caffeine after one o'clock. I Ooh. also um, have CBD oil, which is, um, uh, okay. yeah. whoops, I don't, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, okay. Well, at any rate, okay. it, this is, it tastes like St. Joseph's aspirin, the, ba the aspirin, the orange stuff that you had when you were a child? Did your mother give you that? No, we had cowpole. In England, we have cowpole. Oh, okay. It was well, a strawberry this is favorite orange, cowpole. Yeah. Orange yeah. flavor. 10 of these drops under your tongue and you are yeah. so chilled. But that's can only just, like- Can you go into detail? How does that help you? Um, yeah, when it hits my system, when I yeah. put it under my tongue and it hits my system, everything just calms down, dials back. It's- um. It's a broad spectrum. I don't know how, how to explain it. it. Without, it's not the stuff that makes you stoned. It's just the stuff yes, that makes you with, relax. Yeah, it's without. Um, oh gosh, I forgot. THC. The th th yeah. THC. Th th huh? THC. THC. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. This, it's without that, this yeah. company is owned by Israelis yes. that live in the United States. And so, um, so it's fantastic. The other thing that I do is magnesium. I either do calm in a drink or I take a magnesium pill. Oops, sorry, and this helps know. relax magnesium. Yeah. I know magnesium, yeah, magnesium helps to relax. Yes. It stretches out your muscles and, and you just really, I, I am so if happy. If you can't calm, I'm, yeah. I, yeah. If you can't, yeah. if you're like shaky in bed and you can't relax, magnesium is fantastic. I do know that. Yes. The other thing is every night I look like Elvis. From nine o'clock on, <laughs> uh, I have blue line. light blocking, blue light, what do they call those? The ray blocking light. And yeah, so I wear that. My husband comes in, he can't take me seriously after nine o'clock. <laughs> now at nine o'clock and 10 o'clock on my cell phone, I have an alarm. Nine o'clock says, get ready for bed. 10 o'clock says lights out. And okay. people know, don't call me unless it's an emergency. Don't call me. Uh -huh. Um, I, I, I hesitate to put my phone on, on do not wake me up there because I have the seven children. And I, I don't want to do that. Um, yeah. the other thing is I set the, um, Mazgan summer yeah. or winter depends yeah. um, on 60, 66 degrees. That okay. is the optimal sleeping, you know, 
Um, I also have a comfy quilt and, and pillow made by Freed, F-R-I-D. It's yeah. an Israeli company and they make bed linens and there you can get in that blanket. It's so comfy. And if you're laying on a Gumavir mattress, you are so ready for sleep. It, you've tasted, you've, you know, tried And do you find things. all these things have like helped you have a much better night's sleep? Absolutely. And um, also when it was recommended, I got to take the bioidentical hormones. So um, one of the doctors here, and that seems to calm down my nervous system like a lot. So I'm not having as many um, symptoms. Oh, look, I froze. Oh. oh, great. Okay, I'm still here. Um, whoever well, ever freezes in the middle of an interview, don't worry. Now you know that I look crazy and ridiculous, but you know what? I don't care. I'm getting over my anxiety and I'm going to continue this interview. <laughs> Go, girl. <laughs> um, yeah, how did you find that? Um, how do you find that sleeping better? How has it, how has it like calmed your anxiety? How has it helped the anxiety? By testing it. Because I wear one okay. of these watches, um, yeah. I know that if I sleep five hours or six hours, as I used to be able to do when I was younger, I thought um, that I'm in a completely different emotional state. I'm in like survival mode. I'm just trying to get through the day so I can get back into my bed. Yeah. And I noticed that when I sleep seven and a half to eight, hours and maybe 15 minutes that's optimal I bounce out of bed I'm ready to to you know to dance so yeah fine so it's by so, try, all of this has been by trial and error and I'm yeah. sorry that I it took me this long to learn these lessons but, whoever's watching this please take the lessons now like learn from our mistakes let's say that let's learn from our mistakes you don't need to also make the mistakes you know sometimes we can learn yes. from other people's mistakes yeah yeah. Okay, and if, so, if you have trouble getting any of these items, just let Tally know and, and she'll with let pleasure. me. pleasure, we'll definitely part of Yeah, we'll hook you yeah. up, don't worry. <laughs> um, okay, what else do you do to help yourself? Um, journal, I journal a lot. A huge um, one, yes. Yeah, I carry around um, two different notebooks. One is I'm doing Benjamin Hardy's 30 Days Future, Future Self. Self. I've done that. Yes. That's yes. a game changer. I didn't do it every day. I didn't do it every day. I, well, but, I watched it yeah. every day in one day. <laughs> I that watched would... all the videos in one day, made notes in my notebook, and then went back and filled in the exercises. And, and that's been a game changer. And he's fantastic. You can reach out to him. He's always Benjamin Hardy. Back. Yeah, he's got it's free. Uh, the fu uh, fu 30 days to 30... future self. Something like that. Ex 30, 30 day future self. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But, so uh, a lot of journals. Only do it if it's not going to give you anxiety. If it's going to give you anxiety, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Or if it gives you anxiety, have Tali walk you through what you need to do to get your yes. growth fast. It's meant to, it's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's to improve your life. Yeah. Yes. So I think that through the, all of these anxiety journey, you know, this whole journey, yes. I think that I've demonstrated resilience because I keep popping back up like one of those um, rope and rope dolls. <laughs> and so these are the things that I do to do that, you know, just try to stay calm and what's the word grow from all this, Breathe. because this is given, this is given to you to grow. It's not a yeah. punishment. It's not. No. no, definitely not. Um, okay. Uh, do you have any anxiety triggers today? Just family drama. How many drama but I, I'm, I'm learning how to distance myself from that. I'm learning what other people's issues might be and putting it's them in It's not my your pocket. issue. Not, not my your circus, issue. Not my not, monkeys. Not your circus, not your monkeys. <laughs> and you know what? Even if you're part of the circus, it still doesn't mean that we ha we're not responsible for other people's emotions, you know? You yeah. can help people yes. without being absorbed by their emotions and absorbed by their issues. Well, you I'm very blessed. I have a wonderful sister. And so together we're learning... These I've heard about your sister. Things. Yes. <laughs> oh, she's fantastic. Yeah. So yes. Um, so we're sharing these tools. Every time I learn something new that's gonna help us, yeah. I share it with her. Yeah. Well, she's the one in America, right? She's the one who's the closest to my mom in Sarasota. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you have a message for people um who are watching this and still feel that shame of having anxiety? It's not anything you did and it's being done 
for you, not to you. Yeah. So this is an opportunity to go inside and rearrange your mental furniture, you know, add some new pieces and reach out to people who can help you with this. If you don't know the route, find somebody and model after them what you need to do. It doesn't have to be um, like this. It does not have to be like no. this. There are resources out there. Yeah. And there's so much joy in life. There's so, so many things, even with all of these things that I've been through, I'm yeah. still so grateful for this journey. And I, I only want like 40 more years. <laughs> so I hope you get it and more, honestly. <laughs> and yeah, you know, I said it before and I'm going to say again, I hope when I grow up, I'm just like you. I hope I have the same resilience. I honestly, it's really, yeah, really inspiring. I'm blessed to have you. Thank you. I'm very blessed, you know, and always hang out with younger people. You know, older people tend to fetch a lot. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't mean, I mean, like, you know. I know, know children, mean? children, yes. Children are very carefree. Children they just love and I have bounce a house. off. And what? I have, a house, I have a house full of pre-army guys. I have three guys going into the army. I've known them since they're 15. They bring so much joy and so much um, vivaciousness to my house yes. that, you know, th stay, stay with your tribe not you know do you know what i mean people Find who like who, people yeah people who are like people who you can connect to yeah, yeah. um yeah in one sentence quickly i just want to ask you about your soup business that you did in the zuchot of your son if somebody would like to get in touch with you about that how can okay, they how well, does it work? it's it's not a business per se it's a gamma ah, in that okay. um people donate I have this sweet little coach um, wallet that my sister gave me and people put money in to keep it going. And so far we've been able to serve anybody in Mali Adumin that needs it. Um, there are other soup projects in the Goosh. I have another girlfriend who's running one there. Yeah. And then uh, there might be one in Beit Shemesh, I'm not sure. Um, but this is a, a, it's like liquid love. It's a chance for me to connect with my son because he was so giving with food and giving out bread, but not any bread, artisanal bread. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so so the soup gemach exists and it makes me happy to be able to be in service and just to always try to stay in service. It's like chicken that soup. That means to yourself oh. too. Yes, yes, like liquid love. Liquid love. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that journey. So thank you so much for sharing your story. And thank you so much for sharing your tips on how you help yourself today with anxiety. Um, you know what, I want to, um, I'm going to post the link to how to get in touch with Yael as a resilience coach and how to get in touch with her soup gamak if you want to donate money, or if you're a maladim and you need soup, um, we're going to post um, Yael's contact details. Yael, thank you very, very much. My pleasure.